So I'm curious then, just like you talked a lot about like the argument from contingency. So obviously like Dr. Oppie, like he talks a lot about like having like saying like, well, if the theist can say like God is necessary. The naturalist can say, that, you know, there's like this necessary, mm -hmm. maybe like initial state of reality. Um, and that's just like, there's our necessary thing. And like naturalism is going to eventually like be the superior view when we look at it, at least from like simplicity. So I'm just curious then, like, how do you like maybe in the book respond to this? Or like, how have you kind of like changed in your thoughts regarding like this idea of Oppie's? Yeah. So um, this debate in part started out, um, or at least probably one of the reasons that we were invited to do this book together um, is because I, I previously said in a, a paper in a journal that uh, Graham is right, that um, many existing versions of, uh, of a cosmological argument uh, fall prey to this objection, um, including, uh, so he was, he was attacking Timothy O'Connor's version uh, and I think he's right that O'Connor's version has this problem that the naturalist can reproduce the theist explanatory success, um, at least to a certain extent or within, within certain bounds. But what I'm trying to say is that if the naturalist is going to, uh, if the naturalist is going to respect the science, which is the naturalist's whole game, um, then they can't get the kind of entity with current science that is going to do the kind of explanatory work that we need here. And the explanatory work that we need here is uh, we need a non-causal, non-necessitating explanation. So we need a an explanation that stands outside the sequence of causes and that explains the sequence of causes in a way that still allows that they could be otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and there just isn't anything in current science that fits the bill. And as far as Graham's own position, um, what I'm really pressing him on is that if you look at um, if you look at current science, the suggestion is that the kind of structure of the universe didn't have to be the way it is, that we could have had a, a steady state universe that goes from eternity to eternity without expanding or collapsing if the kind of parameters were just right um, and and so on. So the, and that's, and that's not what we see. And so when, when he says, well, there's an initial state of the universe that's necessary, um, he needs to explain if, if he's going to be consistent with kind of how naturalism is supposed to work he needs to explain how that perspective on necessity is consistent with and preferably even derived from current science. Hmm. And he is not going to be able to do that by taking the things that the physicists say in plain English at face value. Hmm. Okay, now I'm, I mean, I'm hedging a bit here, right? Because there's really mm -hmm. difficult issues about how best to interpret the physical theories. Our current theories are not final theories, right? There's always gonna be further progress. There are some known unsolved problems. And also there's this issue about um, how much weight should you put on what the physicists say when they're kind of trying to explain in plain English for popular audiences versus like being deep down in the math, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but the, the thing that, that I think he hasn't done is to explain how his view is coming out of current physics. And I think he needs to do that if he's trying to show that uh, this perspective is one that a naturalist can adopt. Hmm. That's super helpful. Cause like sometimes when I've thought about like Oppie's ideas, I think about it like, well, from the armchair, like maybe he has a point um, and there might be some advantages here. But when you think about like at least when I think about like Big Bang cosmology and you look at like um, being able to trace the universe back to some sort of singularity to like 10 to the negative 40 or 50th second or something like that. I'm probably getting it wrong because I haven't looked at the science in a while. Um, and it's like, it seems super implausible and they say like, well, maybe there's just like somehow there's this initial state within this singularity or something like that. It just like, I share that intuition of like reflecting on it. Like it seems like not to line up with science, not that it can't, but it's just, it just seems unlikely. Yeah, so I mean, so it could be, I mean, certainly there are people who would like people, you know, including scientists, including physicists who would hope that in the future, 
kind of a completed physical theory would show that there's only one possible initial condition for the universe. Um, that would be really nice. It would get rid of some unexplained brute facts. And so maybe somebody could kind of hope that we're headed there. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we also, we have to be, we have to be careful as well that um, when we talk about singul singularity, a singularity is not like a physical object or like a moment in time or something. It just means you get that far back and the math breaks down and everything goes crazy and stops making sense. Yeah. So, right. So as you get kind of arbitrarily close to the, the zero point, you get a mathematical singularity, which is things going to infinity when they shouldn't in the mm. equations. Um, and so this talk about an initial singularity is kind of a, a loose, it's kind of loose talk. But what we have is, and what Graham says when he's being careful, um, which is most of the time, is, is that we have um, uh, we have a universe that's finite in age. And so there's kind of some initial segment of the universe that he thinks is necessary. And then you get some like quantum randomness that might make things uh, contingent uh, because there's more than one way those, those quantum events can go. But it's that claim of necessity on the initial segment that is something that um, I don't think somebody who's respecting current science should be prepared to make that statement. Thank you.